My name is uh, Espion Skud, and my uh, colleague and Christian Elen and I from the Danish National Archives will today tell you about our new group of methods for assessing file formats and ultimately how to create well reasoned preservation plans. We call this the concept model for development of preservation plans. The, we developed this model from 2019 to 20, and it came to be from acknowledging a need to collaborate to a much higher degree, both internally and externally, in our plans on how to preserve data. And we needed a method to guide and document these plans. We have uh, agreed, and Christian and I, and I, that I will talk about the methods of the concept model and, uh, and Christian will uh, talk about how we implement the model. And even though it is us who is uh, presenting this model, we are by far not the only ones who have worked on it. It was and is a team effort, but it also takes a community. And some of you will be able to identify aspects and theories of these methods which you already use in your own organizations. So the question which the, the concept model tries to solve is to which degree does your archive's existing portfolio of approved data formats preserve the properties of data which the producers and users deem important when they're using data? And when I talk about properties, we understand this, this as the technique which is behind data. For example, a Word document has text, font, colors, pictures, etc. And that is why the concept model must result in preservation plans which considers file format suitability and robustness, consequences when ingesting new file formats, and validation requirements. When we talk about suitability and robustness, uh, it is an assessment of how feasible a file format is for long-term preservation. Validation is a method for verifying that data have been submitted according to your regulations. And you could also call this uh, quality control. When we do our analysis, we look at content types, which we define as groups of file formats that have been created and are used for the same purposes. And over time, we will develop new preservation plans when our management uh, will allocate the necessary resources. And so this is a bit of background, uh, but let us get deeper into the challenge. So, and, and this is here, here you see our existing file format portfolio. These are the ones that we currently approve for submission. As you can see, it is very limited and we wanted to develop these methods for allowing, if not all, then some of those formats that are exemplified to the, to the right. And we wanted to be able to accept these or approve these in a documented way. Um, and contrary to what many other organizations or archives do, we do not operate with preferred or acceptable file formats. So far, we only have approved file formats. And uh, in the case where, for instance, there's, there's TIFF or JPEG 2000 to choose between, uh, then the data producer who is submitting data to us uh, has the option to pick one of those. Um, and TIFF or JPEG 2000 C at DK, we call these preservation formats. And here you, then see our answer for how to allow newer preservation formats. And this is the model in notational form. And it, I'm sure it must look very confusing for you right now. Uh, it shows all the steps that we must go through during the uh, investigation. Uh, and that was also, for in order for you to be able to understand this better, we will also during this presentation, go through each one of these steps for you. So it is our promise that after today, you will know what this, is, this model is really about. 
we hope so at least. <laughs> and first, you must know about how an investigation uh, is initiated. Typically, it begins with our ingest unit will come across submission information packages that could contain data which cannot readily be converted to our specification without a significant data loss. We determine whether this is true or not, uh, or rather to determine whether this is true or not, then they contact us, the digital preservation unit, and we perform a screening. The purpose is here to correctly identify the content type and file formats which are causing issues and complete a quick analysis of the situation. And this will lead to one of three recommendations, as you can see, A, B, C, and A is the content type may pres be preserved in an existing preservation format. B is the same as A, but we assess that the migration result in a loss of data quality, which should be investigated further. Therefore, we register this content type on our priority list. And C, the content type may in fact not be preserved in an existing preservation format because of two significant data loss. And therefore we also register the content type on the same list. This screening process is very useful because it enables us to very quickly form an answer without initiating a full investigation. And instead management may prior prioritize the limited resources we have available for analysis. The priority list is meant to be prioritized each year, but currently we do not have this in effect because we are conducting a, a rather large revision project on our legislative framework. And it is this project that manages all our analytical resources and it does so until at least 2023. Yes, and this, this, is, this is where the actual concept models truly begins. This is the first step after a content type has been selected. We start a pre-analysis and we call it pre-analysis because here we collate a fundamental knowledge of file formats, properties and stakeholders. These stakeholders are for instance, the data producers and archival users. Information is collated through internet research. Typically, that's how we do it. And preferably, we will be able to locate property uh, tables. And we also do have initiate dialogue with our ingest and dissemination units. And we use characterization tools to work with the actual data. And all this information that we collate, we will be using them in the next steps. So we go to the migration analysis, the migration assessment. This next step uh, is supposed to deliver an answer to whether one or more of your archives existing preservation formats are able to keep the significant properties of data with an acceptable loss. And this is very similar to some of the things we do in screening. But when we do it in, 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 in the migration assessment, we do it a lot more in depth. It means that these methods will lead to us taking not days to complete a screening, but months to complete uh, migration assessments. Um, and the fundamental thing which the migration assessment does is that it compares the results that we get from a technical object analysis with the results we get from a stakeholder analysis that we perform based on use case interviews. This, I'm sure this sounds uh, familiar to some of you because we, we apply the inspect framework that was developed by Garrett, Garrett Knight in 2008 and nine, We have, uh, however, slightly adapted 
adapted his framework based on our interview experiences, because we found it was often difficult to have a meaning, meaningful conversation with a stakeholder where we discuss these properties if the content type is complex and has many properties. And we came across this when we did the investigation of spreadsheets. So instead, we focus on getting descriptions of use cases and user demands. Inspect is very useful for us because it provides us with a framework for interacting with a designated community. And you can see in the picture below, you see an illustration of uh, what this conclusion that we want to form. And it is it's from a theoretical point of view. Uh, you see migration of data must to the widest possible extent, make sure that data are experienced in the same way before and after migration. And this is both a question of retaining the information, but also of a question of retaining the interactivity. And at our archive, previously we have focused rather solely on retaining the information. This has been the focal point for us. But this new model will help us open up to more interactivity. And it will do so because we can get validation from, from our designated community. And if this migration assessment leads to a conclusion that we cannot uh, do the migration without uh, uh, an ex unacceptable loss, then we have to continue and do a format assessment. This method scores a selection of file formats from the pre-analysis in a matrix consisting of 20 different criteria. This is, for instance, documentation, openness, lossless, prevalence. And also when we talk about prevalence, we, we see it from two different points of view. We see it from a general point of view, how widely adopted is this file format, but we also see it from the point of view of how many other archives internationally are using this file format for digital archiving. The method, as I, as I mentioned, the method uses a matrix and we have uh, also developed this one drawing on inspiration from other archives and this is especially the Swiss Federal Archives. Our matrix is a binary weighted score for each criterion. And we have selected three of these to be stopping points. You can see them marked with red. These are lifespan, significant properties, and compression. This means that if the file format cannot get a one on these, then extraordinary circumstances must exist for recommending the file format. We also weigh the criteria so that so that the value is multiplied by either one, two, or three, depending on the importance of a criterion. If special circumstances exist for a criterion, it may be flagged and described. At the end, we have a final score, which enables us to compare the file formats and recommend the ones with the highest score. This step, will lead to a recommendation of one or more preservation formats if any are suitable. And then we go to the next step. This is testing. The recommended preservation format must be tested for software that can characterize, convert, and validate the format. When you characterize data, you use a tool to describe the content and metadata such as when was the file created and what compression is applied. We already did this in the pre-analysis, but here we document the test setup. Conversion tests the loss of properties when converting to the recommended file format. And validation tests whether a tool is able to verify those properties that we either require or disapprove. And a preliminary list of properties we can use this one from the migration assessment. When we test software, it typically involves researching existing software on the market, but it may also involve developing a prototype. 
now we are at P4, consequence assessment. This step measures the consequences in economy, time, and quality for implementation of the recommended preservation format. Or it could also alternatively be a preservation level, which is something I will talk about a bit later. The purpose of this method is to see when you turn those archival knobs, there are usually advantages and disadvantages that pull in different directions. For instance, a new preservation plan costs money if a new validation tool must be developed. But on the other hand, a new preservation format might result and ideally should result in higher reusability of data. Requirements for migration have cause for the data producers when they create the submission information package, but recommending a file format which may be validated by a tool eliminates manual workloads during ingest. And for instance, higher validation requirements may lead to a data quality that has higher demands for storage. And what we see is that this, is, that this situation is very different every time we investigate a new content type. The consequences are not the same. Therefore, it is a complex procedure to introduce a new preservation format. And this step enables us to quantify these consequences in units that are digestible for the management and also highlight who the consequences hit. Is it in your archive or is it the data producers who must invest? Yes. And finally, we have a preservation plan that is drafted. The plan collates all the previous steps in a specification, which must include any validation requirements. The plan tells how certain data should be migrated to which formats and in which quality and which tools to use. The preservation plan concludes the investigation and we send it to management as a decision recommendation. And if they approve it, then we can commence an implementation. What were these preservation levels? Yes, this is a term we have created to handle a situation where the selection of a preservation format or keeping the data in our collections are not feasible at the moment. This means, for instance, that we will consider a preservation plan where orig only the original data may be kept or only or data are kept at a proxy organization. We have not yet determined the actual, actual preservation levels uh, which we will use in the future. This is a thing that is in pro progress. We also did pilot testing of the concept model. We did two, one on spreadsheets and one on genetics. Uh, if we take a look at our investigation of spreadsheets, then um, we were aware of that there were some challenges with our existing preservation plan. We Currently, we image to TIFF. So we wanted to investigate this and potentially reformulate our preservation plan. And what, what we found out is that spreadsheets are complex data. Uh, we saw there was approximately 200 properties to consider. And, and the question is, which ones are then significant? To determine this, we held interviews with data producers such as a municipality, the Danish National Bank, and two other Danish archives. and we. Um, also, at the same time, we collaborated, and, and we still continue to do this, with the uh, OPF Archives Interest Group. Um, we do analysis and tool development here, and uh, the group plans to conclude the work by delivering a report on significant properties later this year. However, in Denmark, we found uh, this uh, investigation resulted in uh, the recommendation of open document spreadsheets as a new format, and uh, we are currently continuing work on this. Uh, we are looking into the validation requirements and potential validation tools, and we also want to reach out if the OPF community has uh, uh, experts on the preservation of spreadsheets, we would very much like to get in touch to continue with the, the genetical data. We uh, found out we saw that first and foremost, we do not currently ingest 
uh, genetical data in our collections, and we have no expertise on the field. So the interesting question for us was how could the concept model help us reach a preservation plan? And um, we found out that genetics consists of many types of data, which ranges from the raw data from the sequencing machines to smaller data formats, and they are used for analytical purposes. And so even though we also saw that the raw data are not necessarily complex, but the, the storage demands are very high. And uh, on the other hand, the conversion of raw sequences to analytical formats, they require some competencies uh, that we do not possess and an IT setup we do not possess. We talked with the University of Copenhagen, the National Genome Center and Aalborg University Hospital. And simply put, we would be unable to do any kind of qualified work on a preservation plan if we did not have conducted these interviews. It's uh, invaluable for us. Um, and, and we also found out that we need a new preservation level uh, potentially, uh, and this is to keep the, the data at a proxy, uh, the National Genome Center. So hopefully you get the understanding that it's very important to talk with the data producers and archival users uh, about their use cases and what are the expectations for how to interact with data. And it is not just a desk job to assess which interactivity a user in, for instance, 50 years wishes for data. Yet we cannot predict the future. We can, uh, however, through use of interviews and custom made questionnaires, gain an understanding of the service needs and those properties that they deem important to use today. Um, and, and we have been met with, can I say it in any other way than with open arms and a willingness to uh, participate. They're motivated to talk with us. Um, and also internally, we need to foster a good collaboration, especially for us with the ingest unit and the dissemin dissemination unit. Um, they were very important for us to be able to contact the right stakeholders and get the right information about the issues. So before I give the floor to Anne Christian, I will very, very quickly uh, summarize. Uh, and during this presentation, you were presented to the purpose, methods, experiences, and the collaborative approach of our newly developed concept model. So our concept model is very briefly, it's methods for collating knowledge about data, assessing data formats, testing software, collaborating internally and externally, recommending a level for preservation of data and developing plans for preservation of data. And we uh, plan to use this in the future uh, when we assess types of data which are already in our collections or that we expect to have. And we have also chosen to make this concept model available on GitHub. And we hope that you want to go and take a look there. Uh, we have uh, translated it to English. Uh, we want to be transparent about what kind of methods that we use. And we would very much appreciate feedback from our international peers. Um, so please go and, uh, and take a look. And uh, now I will hand the floor over to you and Christian. And now I will tell you a little about how we plan to implement this uh, new concept model uh, for development of preservation plans at the Danish National Archives. Oops, there we go. <laughs> um, first of all, um, I will tell you a little about how, um, how these methods um, will support the Danish National Archives new national legislation on how to produce and submit information packages to the archive. Uh, on your right here, you can see our existing, existing uh, executive order on how to submit information packages. But we are revising that plan and we are implementing a new preservation concept in, this, in the new executive order. And uh, this a new concept model uh, is actually part of our new preservation concept. Uh, so this is, uh, we will implement this in the new executive order and we will do it in a way that will 
enable us to add new preservation plans uh, for more content types uh, after release of the executive order. Because uh, one of our challenges today, um, as Ashbjörn also mentioned, is that there's a lot of content types out there in the real world that we can't really preserve because we don't have a preservation plan for um, types, uh, content types like 3D or maybe email or astronomy data and biotemporal databases. Um, and also we will use this concept model for prioritizing which um, preservation plans to develop first and for which content types. And uh, at the bottom of the slide, I try to illustrate this um, a new way of uh, saying that when we release the executive order in, we plan to release it in 2023. Uh, in this new executive order, we, we plan to have preservation formats for databases, for statistical data, which is also preserved in database uh, format in Denmark, um, and also preservation formats for geodata, both raster and vector geodata. And, and as uh, Ashburn also mentioned, we have these TIFF uh, MP3 and MPEG formats for different kinds of documents. Um, but also now I, I, I illustrate here that a new preservation format uh, for the, the spreadsheets could be uh, a conversion to TIFF and the original uh, spreadsheet uh, along with then submitted in the same information packet. That would be one of these uh, preservation levels that Ashburn talked about, but it could also uh, be recommending the ODS, uh, the open format for spreadsheets. Uh, we haven't settled that yet. But this is just an example. And then maybe a year after, we might have had time to develop new preservation plans for bitemporal databases, uh, which is also a challenge right now at the archive, how to submit those. Um, and maybe we have another preservation format for the geo raster data, maybe the geotiff. But again, we are not experts in all these content types. So uh, we need time to actually develop these um, preservation plans. And this is just a little a bit more about the plans for the new executive order. We plan to implement the, the European um, preservation formats from the EARC3 project. Uh, they have specifications for a, a new packet structure, information packet structure. It's called the common uh, a common specification for information packages, the CSIP. And that specification also used the MET standard for describing this structure and how to place things in the structure. And this EARC project has also uh, specified um, specifications that they call content information type specifications, the SITs, uh, both for uh, C, uh, preservation of databases using the CIAT format. And there's also a SITs for geospatial data but these specifications are also at, at the upper level of the packet structure, how to place a CIAT file inside the information package and how to document the geospatial data, but no actually requirements on preservation formats uh, on that level. So what you see below is that we also need um, these new preservation plans, new uh, formats for how to preserve raster-based geodata. We do at the Danish National archive have a preservation format for vector-based geodata, but not raster-based. So that will be a new format in the new executive order. And also, as we mentioned, the spreadsheets. And the plan is also um, not to use uh, the CRDK um, specification for databases as we do today, but to actually use the new uh, revised uh, CR 2.1 um, preservation format for database archiving. And also we are looking into metadata standards already existing out there instead of defining our own metadata standards for the information package. That could be the DCAT uh, standard for data catalogs, describing data catalogs, or the DDI for describing statistical data, or INSPIRE for describing uh, geodata. So that was just a little bit about the future uh, in Denmark. Um, and now I will go. Um, to explain to you how we use uh, these methods uh, that uh, Ashbjorn just explained to you. 
in the archive. And as he also mentioned, a new thing for us when we start using this concept models when, when deciding on preservation formats is that we actually start collaborating between the departments of the archive, uh, both the interest and the preservation and the access team, as I call it. I mean, as Bjorn, you called it the dissemination unit. We call it something different, but it's the same. Um, and of course, we use all the methods that Aspian just described in the model, both the screening, the migration assessment, format assessment, and so on. And, um, and Aspian, as Aspian also said, uh, part of this uh, migration assessment is to actually to go out interviewing the data producers and users to identify the significant properties of the content types. And this is also new to us. Uh, we might have done it a little bit before when deciding on preservation formats, but basically it was this desktop job for some, some very technical colleague in the archive. So now we are really reaching out and that's because um, if we need to preserve more different kinds of content types, we need to uh, be guided by the experts out there who are really experts in the data that they create and use. Um, and this is a case uh, of a screening that we just adjusted uh, a month ago, actually. Um, uh, it's a screening of the, the content type, the digital underwater terrain model, which is a map of the sea. You can see it on your right. And what happened was that the data producer, when submitting data to us, uh, told us that uh, we would lose information if we migrated the the ENC format, this uh, uh, underwater terrain model map, if we just migrated that to GML, which is our preservation format uh, for vector data. Um, and they said that we would lose this scamming value uh, that link attributes to zoom levels and also something object relational. And uh, what we did um, at the DNA uh, was that the preservation team, which uh, I'm part of, uh, we went back to the data producers and asked them to explain to us what the scamming value is about and what that object relational part of the ENC format is all about and what is it actually used for. And uh, what they explained that, well, the scamming value, uh, which um, is actually used when you, you use these maps for sailing and you zoom into the map, and the more you zoom into the map, uh, you will see different attributes on the map. You will see maybe more stones in the water or uh, more depths, and so more information that you can sail after, so you don't sail into anything. Uh, and the object relational was uh, something that harbor is not just a harbor, it could also be a very deep um, uh, part of the ocean. It, it, it could have different, uh, again, different attributes and descriptions uh, linked to the geometry of the map. Um, so now we didn't know what it was all about. What would we lose if we migrated to GML? And then we went to the interest team and then we asked them, well, what uh, information do you actually do we as an archive actually want to preserve? Is this loss acceptable that we don't get the scamming value or the object relational part of the the data? Um, and also, uh, we could go to the access team. Actually, we just asked the interest team this question too, but we asked them, well, how do you? expect the future user of these archive data to use this data? Will they sail um, based on the archive map, a map 100 years old? Uh, can you use that for sailing or what will happen? What do you expect? Um, and again, ask the question, is the loss acceptable? And we actually concluded uh, that the loss is acceptable. Uh, and also, yeah, first of all, because we don't expect uh, a user in 100 years to be sailing after these maps, they will probably use the, the newest maps uh, from the, uh, those producing those maps. Um, but they predicted that, that this, these archived uh, digital underwater terrain models would probably be used uh, uh, by researchers who wanted to compare them with paper maps or something like that. And also the data producer told us that we could actually create the, 
uh, the information lost, we could recreate it if we, um, based on the knowledge of the, the ENC standard uh, called S57, which was the, yeah, the, the standard that this data was created in. Um, so at this point, we, we didn't do more than just the screening. Uh, and concluded they could convert the data to GML. However, if we had concluded that this loss is not acceptable, we would put this content type on the priority list. Um, and then we would go to actually uh, do all the analysis in the concept model that Espion just told you about. Um, and I don't think I will say it again because it's the same, but um, yeah do both a pre-analysis and a migration assessment in more depth, uh, because if we don't accept the loss, uh, then we have to really document what is lost and really understand it and try to figure out what other formats could actually hold uh, this information when we do the migration and so on. So we need to, a lot more information to be able to actually um, find candidates for suitable preservation formats. Um, Yes, before we could make an actual preservation plan for this kind of data. Um, yes, and uh, finally, I'll just sum up uh, the purpose of this concept model because a colleague of us, uh, who is actually one of the technical colleagues who are helping us doing this work, uh, he asked us, why do I have to use this really complex model? Why do I have to document all this now? We have made preservation plans for 20 years uh, without this model. So why is this model really necessary? And uh, this is our answer uh, to our colleague. Uh, first of all, um, uh, knowledge collection of what content types can we not preserve at the moment? And what, what content types do we need new preservation plans for? We can put that on a list uh, also for resource management, flexibility and transparency. And I'll just explain a bit more about that. So here you see this priority list where we put uh, all the new uh, content types uh, and describe um, different things about it. Is this really, do the data producer have to delete data because of GDPR? So this is really something we need to find a preservation plan fast, then we can mark that in this priority list. And then, uh, then the, the leaders in our organization can actually prioritize the resources um, and tell us what content types we should develop new plans for. And also to allocate the needed resources because that's also a point that uh, it takes time to find uh, a suitable preservation format uh, or suitable preservation level. Um, yes. And um, also this model gives us this flexibility um, to add new preservation plans after release of the executive order, because now we have a very structural way to work um, and do it faster. Um, early on, we had to make a new executive order uh, if we wanted to introduce a new preservation plan. Uh, and we only did that like every 10 years. Um, and so that's why we haven't preserved any uh, yeah, genetic data or, or 3D data. We just convert them to TIFF because that has been our preservation format for 10 years. Um, so yeah, as I said, this gives us the flexibility um, to preserve more actually and faster when needed. So actually adapt to the real world out there uh, when new preservation plans are needed. Um, and this maybe <laughs> explains uh, one of the, the questions in the chat, uh, one asked us, don't we um, uh, allow PDF as preservation uh, uh, format? Why do we ask data producers to, to convert those PDF files to TIFF? Uh, and I must uh, say to you, I actually don't know because that's my technical uh, colleague who can answer that question. Why is PDF not a suitable preservation format? But that is his answer to that question. And I know it's something about that it's a container format, so it can also hold other formats inside it. And it has 
uh, also uh, fonts and all kind of things that are really hard to validate. So that's part of it. But my um, <laughs> what I want to say with this is that if we had uh, made the analysis made uh, uh, using these methods of the concept models, we would actually be able to answer this question because then we would have this format assessment and the score telling why PDF is, is not a good preservation format as TIFF. It's not that it's it cannot be used. We just um, we are not, uh, yeah, we just don't prefer that at the moment. But we might, if we um, do another analysis, uh, come to another conclusion. But uh, my point here is that uh, using this concept model actually uh, gives this transparency of the decision made in the archive, because now we can document how we decided on what preservation formats uh, we have chosen and what's the arguments behind it. Um, yes, I think that was, yes, and uh, we actually also plan to write this uh, kind of communication paper, which we could hand out to the one asking this question, and just a one page format explaining uh, why we chose TIFF as a preservation format instead of PDF, because that's a question we get a lot, and it would be really nice to be able to answer that question, even though we're not the technical guy who made this analysis and this conclusion. Yes, so that's all for me. Oh, brilliant, thank you very much, yes. uh, Aslan and Anne Kristen. So I think we do already have some questions in the chat box. I have a question here. Um, there's one asking in relation to the EARC specification, did you have to, to develop uh, your customizations? That is, did this uh, the specific logical physical components of the IP metadata profiles. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but do you do you ask me? Do we have to adapt it to our needs? Um, do we have to put on further specifications on how we will do it in Denmark at the Danish National Archive? Is that what the question is about? Because yes, uh, we will. We will implement the EAC specifications and we can't change them if we implement them. We'll have to, all the must requirements, we will have to implement as well. Uh, but we might, at the Danish National Archive, we might have further requirements. Um, for example, for the, the CIAT specification, uh, we would like to continue asking the data producer to document uh, the content of the table, the content of the column and so on, the descriptions there. So, so what we will do is that we will add on requirements that, that, um, yeah, that we think is necessary to be able to reuse the archive data. I'm not sure I answered the question, but the logical fiddle, physical, I yeah, and actually, a, yeah. I can yes. read a question, uh, mm -hmm. but I think maybe, and Christian, this is one for you. Um, but I can read it for you. Have you mm -hmm. been able to plan a budget for the future for institutions to plan ahead? How much, on average, uh, time money needs to be spent on a preservation packet, and how, how often does this need to be done for formats? Um, no, we we haven't um, made a budget plan like that. Um, I know that we have tried to to calculate uh, what uh, yeah what is the cost uh, submitting to the archive and so on, but it's quite hard to actually make that analysis. But I, I know that that the EAC project actually uh, had a project about that, so maybe there are uh, some results from the EAC project. But we haven't done that uh, at the Danish National Archive. But of course. When we um, implement a new executive order and when we make requirements, every time we want make a requirement for the data producer, when they have to submit data to us, it, it gets more expensive for them. So we are, we are very uh, considering who will actually have to have this, um, uh, yeah, uh, ex yeah, who will, 
pay for that? Uh, is that the archive we should pay for? Should we uh, do it? And actually, we we are considering at the Danish National Archive. Uh, we haven't decided on it yet, but we are considering. Could we have? Um, could we just ask the data producer to give us uh, some part of the information package, and then we will finalize it in some way, just to actually. Um, do it easier for them to submit to the archive. So we are discussing that as well, but we need, um, yeah, we need to think it through and, and have systems to be able to do that as well, develop the systems needed to support that, that new process as well. Um, and how often do you have to submit to the archive? Is that it? Um, usually, uh, the data producers submit every five every five years in Denmark or every year if it's annual if that makes sense but um, yeah uh, yeah I think that's the answer to that maybe uh, I'm Birgit Olsen from Luxembourg I just had a small uh, question uh, how big is your team and also um, in terms of communication uh, how do you uh, work? Do you work with a Microsoft team or do you have other ways of communicating with these different users to do your work? Thank you. Um, yes, well, the, the digital preservation team, which I'm part of and Aspian is part of, uh, we are, is it like 15 people? Um, and we are also sub teams. Uh, there's the digital preservation team, then there are a team with the testing who are validating the submission information packages on ingest. And we also have a an, an dissemination team in this digital preservation department. And they are just preparing uh, the, the, the archive data for, for use um, for the technical part of it. Uh, recreating the database from the XML format to an SQL database. So we, are, uh, everybody there, we are 15 people. And you ask me, how do we uh, collaborate with people? Do you mean like outside the archive or inside internally? Um, outside the archives, because I yeah. mean, there are different ways, of course, with Microsoft 365 or other sites you may have developed, but I think it's also for the sake of transparency. Yes. Thank you. Well, at the moment, usually what we do is make interviews with data producers and users. We, we meet with them and talk to them and often prepare an interview, um, but there might be other possibilities, as you mentioned there as well. There's Somebody. a question here, uh, it says very interesting case study, but is it slightly risky to depend on internal ingest or access teams to determine acceptable losses of future users of data if consultation with external specialists is a necessary part of understanding the format and data in the first place? Uh, yeah, it might be slightly risky uh, for us to make that decision in the archive, but uh, we did that before as well, just without asking uh, the producers of data. Um, so we think this is a step forward, uh, trying to um, make them ex explain to us what is the loss because, um, and then we can try to, yeah, um, see if that's acceptable or not. But of course, it's always a decision, uh, but we could also agree with the data producer that it's not acceptable. Um, and then we had to find a new preservation format for that kind of data. Mm, um, yes. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's interesting this because usually we, we made these decisions based on the, the format uh, on or the content type. We said uh, all text documents should be converted to TIFF and all MP3, uh, all, uh, sound should be converted to MP3. But actually, when we start using this screening process, what often happens is that, for example, we had this uh, 3D data from some, um, what do you call that, um, archaeology, <laughs> where you find things in the ground and there was a 3D format. And actually, our um, technical uh, 
colleague, he said, well, in this case, it might be uh, enough just to convert it to TIFF to a 2D format because the 3D information is in a database. So in this um, case, uh, I think we should just TIFF it. But in another case, we might want the 3D effect and functionality. So I'm not sure, but this is what is happening right now. So we might, instead of just uh, looking at the format uh, that all 3D should be converted to the, according to this preservation format, we now look into each submission to see what makes sense. And actually, I heard that the, the French National Library, who also did a presentation uh, internationally, they, they did uh, kind of the same, uh, depending on the collection for preservation, what uh, what is uh, so what is an acceptable loss? Uh, so I, I'm not. I don't know if that's a new direction. <laughs> it is for the Danish National Archives if we go in that direction. Um, I don't know how you do it out there. Yes, and uh, very often uh, we also use uh, these other units as intermediaries uh, to get contact to the actual data producers or the yes. users out there. So yeah. uh, we use them also in, in this regard very much. Yeah. But this uh, question to the INTIUS team about, well, what do you really want to preserve? Often they don't preserve everything. They're actually only a, a, a little part of the data is preserved. So it's a, a question that they are asked a lot uh, in their daily work. Um, and, and we ask them because that's not up to us in the digital preservation team to decide what to preserve and why and for whom and so on. So that's the interest team. Um, yeah, who has the knowledge about that? I see there's a question which is looking at the scoring system for format assessment. Where does the accessibility for sight or hearing impaired viewers factor in? And it does not. <laughs> That is true. Uh, we have not um, taken that into consideration. Uh, uh, there's also a question here. Do you rank a file format itself and compare, or do you rank a file format specific for the use in one workflow in a specific way to get it in order to compare it depending on the workflow? I, I'm not sure I understand that question. But... Uh, so in the case of... Um... The question to do um, use TIFF um, yes. and not PDF. Yeah. Um, because PDF uh, uh, TIFF is generally better uh, or has advantages um, to um, PDF, or do you uh, had um, made transformations of the input um, to TIFF or to PDF, or it was PDF before, and compared um, a yeah, specific how concrete this, what you get there. Maybe you you might be thinking about, I'm not necessarily sure either, but there, there's at least a situation that we often encounter, which is when our, when the suppliers for the data producers, the data producers don't themselves create a submission information package. They have a supplier to do it for them. Very often these machines that they have to do conversion, they are based on taking a Word document, but to transform it to a TIFF, then they have an intermediary a format, which is very often a PDF. So they, mm. they PDF a Word and then they TIFF a PDF. And, oh. um, and, that raises some questions in many ways, like well, how, um, why, 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 why should we not accept a PDF, for instance? What, um, um, but as and Christian also have mentioned before, we we have not uh, completed a full investigation on PDF yet, and it would be relevant to look at it. But again, this is also a, a subject matter for our uh, management to decide. Yes, and somebody also asked, uh, what about PDFA? Uh, and uh, we've talked about that as well. And as far as I understand from my very technical colleague, he's not very fond of that either. But he mentioned that there's a new PDF uh, raster 
format, which is quite interesting. So we might look into that in the future. I'm, I don't know what's it about, but it should be more simple uh, than, than the PDFA or the, the ordinary PDFA, uh, yeah, PDF. Yes. Uh, then there's a question here. If I'm understanding correctly, the assessment of the records value independent of format is assessed separately from this concept model. That's correct. Uh, but there's, there's both the, the assessment, uh, should we archive this kind of data and for what purpose? And we don't uh, make that decision. So that's uh, assessed uh, separately. But when you, when you go into deep into the, the actual format, that's um, what we are actually doing now. Uh, we get these new questions. Okay, you say you want to preserve this kind of data, but do you want to preserve all the significant properties of this kind of data? Is that relevant for a future user or for uh, what you actually wanted to preserve? And the conversion to TIFF is a good example of that because what are we actually preserving there? We are not uh, preserving the functionality of the PDF or the the uh, the the doc, what do we call that? The, the office document. Um, we're just uh, preserving the documentation of the, the, the content of the data. So we can like read the text and we can see the formatting, but we don't, uh, we, we cannot change it. We cannot make it bigger or smaller. Um, so, and this, these are the questions that arise now. Uh, is it okay just to tiff everything? Uh, is that good enough for a future user? And, and this is, I hear you say that <laughs> too. Why is PDF not good enough uh, if it's the easiest um, to submit to the archive and the easiest to use after, uh, after some years? So yeah, you have more. Are there ever conflicts between the archives assessments of what should be preserved based on informational value and the outcome of the concept model, what should be preserved based on format specification? If so, how do you resolve this? Um, uh, we haven't um, uh, used the concept model uh, so much yet, but I, I think there will be in the future and how will we resolve that? Uh, I, th um, I think that yeah, I don't know. How do you <laughs> resolve this question? Uh, you just need good arguments. And the arguments that we have at the digital preservation team is that um, an argument could be, well, if we don't preserve the significant property of this content type, the user will not be able to use it again. That's uh, uh, for anything. I mean, uh, so there are levels, uh, something is nice to have, something is really uh, important. And I think that the digital preservation team will just stand on what is, what is really important. We can't lose that because then we can't guarantee that you will be able to open and use this file again. So this is, yeah, our interest, but the, the inches team or the access team might have other arguments that it will be easier to use and it will be easier to hand out in the short term and not the long term that we are looking at, at the digital preservation team. So there are many, um, yeah, there could be conflicts uh, that we will just have to address. Yeah, uh, but we haven't been there yet. Yes, there's this comment regarding EARC specification. They seem to leave room for local implementation profiles, don't they? Yes, they do. And especially when you get to the lower level where you make your preservation plans because the EARC specifications are really, they try to be uh, specifications for information packages that can hold any kind of preservation formats or preservation plans um, available at different archives in Europe. So yes, um, it's possible to make local profiles of the, of the specifications as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, but if we use them as they are and we will also be able to share the tools um, for, 
yeah, for validation and migration and so on, and creating the submission information package. So we try not to change too much uh, at the Danish National Archive to enable the collaboration, the international collaboration on digital preservation. Yes. Okay, um, like I say, sorry we've gone a little bit over time, but um, I just want to say thank you so much to Anne Christian and Asbjorn for your presentation today, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, obviously, there's a few questions we didn't quite get to, um, but you have um, some email contacts address on screen, or you can always contact me and I can forward any of your questions. Um, yeah, so thanks very much to everybody, and we hope to see you next time. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.